Understandably, at this time in my life, I am seeking comfort from the Comforter, from the Holy Spirit. And sometimes comfort comes in some ver- from some very unlikely places. I was reminded recently of a Christmas carol. Now that it's nice and warm, no longer having to shovel that snow, I uh, wondered if God had any left in his storehouse after so generously gifting to us. But I thought about that Christmas carol that I don't usually even think about at Christmas. God rest ye merry gentlemen. That's not on my top ten list for Christmas. But I was thinking, as I looked at the lyrics of that song, it says, God rest ye merry gentlemen. And we will include the ladies in that as well. Gentlewomen, you're welcome. Let nothing you dismay. And I know that in life there are times when dismay comes. Or am I the only one? You sat there silently, maybe I'm the only one. It says, remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power. (laughs) You know, we have an enemy, right? And he doesn't just try one time and give up. But the good news is he's already been defeated. Now, as I mentioned to you in the past, the game continues to go on. We know who wins in the end, but the game continues to go on until the final buzzer sounds. And I'm ready for that final trumpet to sound. But we realize that God is greater than the power of the enemy. God has already won. But many times in life with the battles, the storms, uh, the things, the, the trials, the tribulations, we need to be reminded that God, and thus we as the children of God, have indeed won. Don't get too excited now, pace yourself. When we were gone astray. That to me is the most amazing part of the love of God, that when we were yet sinners, yes, even you, yes, even me, when we were yet sinners, God loved us so much that he provided the one and only eternal sacrifice for our sins, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. When we didn't deserve it, when we were not on our best behavior, God loved us anyway and made a way for us to escape what we deserve. And so then, even on our worst days, when we let our mind dwell on God and the things of God and what God has already done for us, then we can sing these lines that says, Oh, tidings of comfort. And joy. Even in our worst circumstance, even in the midst of the storm, as the winds howl and the waves rise, comfort and joy, oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Because whatever it is that you are going through today will not last forever. The sickness, the job situation, the broken relationship, the lack of provision, whatever it is, this too shall pass. But what remains is God's unconditional, unwavering, unfaltering love for us. And he made a way for escape so that we do not get what we deserve. Come on and give him praise. Come on now. So I want to do something I rarely do. I want to read out of the King James Version today. 
from John 14, 16. I usually read from the New King James, and I'll do that at the end. But I want to read from the King James today because instead of an advocate, a helper, it uses the word comforter when he talks about God, the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, or in the King James, God the Holy Ghost. John 14, 16 says, And I will pray, Jesus is talking here, and I will pray the Father, John 14, 16, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Jesus is saying, I am going to go away, but I'm going to send one like myself. What did Jesus do when he was on the earth? He taught, he showed us the way to live, but he provided comfort. You agree? He provided comfort because he healed the sick, he gave words of life, he raised the dead, and he provided comfort. And so he says, I'm going to go away, but I will not leave you orphans. I will send one like myself, and he will abide with you forever. So when you are in the midst of the storm, and the enemy, the liar, says you're all alone, you know that's a lie because the comforter was sent to abide with you for a day, no, a week, no, a month, no, a year, no, forever. He will be with you forever. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He will be with you forever because that was his mission. So you're never alone. Even though the enemy wants you to believe that. Verse 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Now go to the next chapter, John 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. And so that is the wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit, or you, if you want to use the term ghost, it comes from the same Greek word, pneuma. The Holy Spirit doesn't promote the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come to testify of Jesus. And he points back to the work of Jesus, to the teachings of Jesus. The Holy Spirit doesn't come on the scene and say, hey, look at me, I've arrived, I'm the new comforter, I'm the Holy Spirit, I'm here, I will be with you forever. No, he comes to point back to the atoning, redemptive work of the eternal Lamb of God, Jesus, God the Son, who died on the cross, who was buried, and who rose to life again, appeared to hundreds of witnesses, and ascended back to the Father. He is the spirit of truth. How desperately we need the Holy Spirit today. Because we live in a world full of misinformation, things that certainly are not true. And if you are wandering around as a blind person in the middle of the night, not knowing what to believe, you need the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to teach you all things truthful. There should be no excuse if we are the children of God to wonder what should I believe, what is true, what is false, because we are not orphans. God sent this comforter, this paraclete, this helper, this advocate, but he's also a teacher, the spirit of truth to guide us into all truth. We call this discernment of the spirit. You know, I've heard people who aren't believers, they say that they got this feeling, and if they are Spider-Man fans, and I've heard some of them say this, their spider senses started tingling. 
their spidey senses. I'm like, that ain't no spidey sense. That's the Holy Spirit of Almighty God that you don't recognize yet trying to help you. But when we as believers have it, it is the Holy Spirit trying to lead us, guide us, keep us from making mistakes. We are to be students of the Word, but as we leave the Word and go out into the world, we are to be guided nudged, prodded, prompted by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth who guides us into all truth. So what you may think is spidey sense is the Holy Spirit. Even though I'm a Parker, I'm not related to Peter Parker, I don't have a spidey sense, I have the Holy Spirit. Even though there's a certain hotel I check into every time in Bangkok, and when I tell them my name is Parker, they're like, they whisper to each other, Peter Parker, Peter Parker, Peter. I'm like, no, do you see the suit? I do not have a Spider-Man suit. <laughs> Flip over to John 16 in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you. It is necessary for you. It is helpful for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Thank God, Jesus came and completed his redemptive mission. He did everything he needed to do. He was chastised. He was scourged. He was beaten. He was spat upon. He, he, he was uh, punched. A uh, crown of thorns was jammed into his cranium. He was spat. Uh, nailed to a tree and he gave his life so we could have eternal life Amen. then he rose from the grave he appeared to hundreds of witnesses uh, he continued to teach and then he ascended from the Mount of Olives back to the Father and then about 10 days later on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came that makes me know number one Jesus made it safely to his destination because he said if I don't go away I won't be able to sin but if I go away I will sin and so we know that Jesus arrived safely at the right hand of the Father what is he doing there he is making intercession in his high priestly role when we pray in his name so if you want Jesus to, to intercede for you, to help you with your prayer, pray in his name. Right. And so when people get all upset and they uh, want to invite me to pray somewhere, he said, but just don't, pray, just don't say that name. Well, honey, that's what it's all about. Right. I'm not going to pray at all if I can't pray in the name of Jesus. So, because to me, that's not even a prayer. That's just getting up there and, and reciting a bunch of words. But when I get up to pray, I pray in the name of Jesus because I want Jesus at the right hand of the Father to intercede for that request. So we see here that in chapter 14, if you go to verse 15, I didn't read it to you, but it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, do what I say. Do what I've told you to do. Because we know the Old Testament teaches us rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. So if we don't just say, I love you, Jesus, I love you, Jesus, but we prove it by what we do. If we keep his commandments, that proves that we love him. Still awake out there? Okay, about five of you. So if we indeed love Jesus, we will do what he's told us to do even when we don't feel like it, even when we don't understand it, we will continue to do what Jesus said to do. Because he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if we want to be comforted, we need to be, number one, in a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, and we need to do what he's told us to do. We need to do what's right. We're not going to be comforted if we are living a life of rebellion or if we're living in disobedience. God is not going to bless you if you don't do what he's told you to do. And no, he's not going to make an exception for you. And no, there's not an asterisk in any version that I've ever seen that says you can do whatever you want. If, fill in name here, you can do whatever you want. This just applies to the other people. So if you want to be comforted, number one, you need to deal with the disobedience in your life. 
And there are people in this room, there are people watching online that have areas of disobedience in their lives. You started getting really quiet now. If God has ever told you to do something and you did not do it, that is disobedience. If it's in his word, you read it, you disregarded it, you said that doesn't apply to me, that is disobedience. If you read it, you didn't like it, and you don't want to do it, that's disobedience. The Word of God is not a buffet where that you pick and choose the dishes that you enjoy. You don't just pick out the comfort foods and leave the foods that are good for you. You make a steady diet of the Word. The parts that you don't understand, you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that meaning to you. Now, I found it helps if you dig into the Word, you study the Word, you don't just read it and say, okay, tell me what it means. We need to be students of the Word, and then when we get to know the Word here, that's not enough. Until we know the word here and it comes out in our actions, that's when we know the word of God. Anything that we don't understand, we can ask God. He says that he gives to us, you know, wisdom if we ask him and don't doubt. And so if there's a part of the word you don't understand, dig into it yourself and ask the Holy Spirit to help you and he will reveal to you, he will guide you into all truth. But we need to obey the Word of God, and we need to obey the Holy Spirit of God. Because there are times in my life, there are times in in your lives that I've heard many testimonies, I can confirm it happens in your life too, where we're out in the world doing this thing we call life, and the Holy Spirit will guide us in real time, in the moment. Sometimes... Uh, I've, the Holy Spirit's done that for me, and he has saved me from uh, probably life injury, life-ending injuries. He has sometimes done things that I didn't even know about. Sometimes the Holy Spirit has helped me, and I responded by getting angry. Because I would be waiting for a flight, and that flight was canceled or delayed, and it would make me angry because I'm a man who likes a plan and works the plan, and then come to find out there was a problem on that flight, and instead of being angry, I became weepy, I became thankful, I became very grateful because it didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen. So in real time, the Holy Spirit leads us, he guides us, he directs us, sometimes he changes our path for our own good, even when we don't recognize it. But when we are in pain, and anyone who would tell the truth would recall a time when you have experienced pain. Well, not me, Pastor, I've never experienced pain. We call that denial. When you are in pain, the Holy Spirit of God is a comforter that will abide with you forever, not just in the storm, not just in the eye of the storm, not just in the immediate aftermath of the storm, but he abides with us forever. He never leaves us, but he comforts us in each painful situation. As the Holy Spirit of God ever comforted you in a painful situation? So he is a comforter from the pain of life. We are looking forward to heaven, but we're not there yet. Are we there yet? Nope, not yet. One of the things I have found that, you know, they say that the two greatest fears in life are death in public speaking. So imagine when I speak at a funeral, what's going on in my head. One of the reasons that I think public speaking is such a fear is because a lot of times we don't want to speak in front of other people. You're wondering what they may be thinking. You don't want to mess up. 
You don't want to embarrass yourself. You don't want to make a fool of yourself. So the important thing is that you want to know your subject matter inside and out. Sometimes we are afraid that someone may ask us a question about what we've said and we don't know the answer. So the Holy Spirit here talks about that he will guide us into all truth. He will teach us. So we should be consoled, comforted in the fact that we don't have to be ignorant. We don't have to say, I don't know. I don't know. When we depend upon, rely upon the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, then we can depend upon him to give us the answer. If someone asks you a question, we see that in the book of Acts that the disciples, the apostles stood before the authorities and the Holy Spirit gave them what to say. As a matter of fact, we're told not to worry about what to say. The Holy Spirit will supply what we need to say. Now, that is not a license for us to be unprepared. Now, I have heard in my lifetime preachers who got up and said that, you know, I just open my mouth and God will fill it. Well, I wouldn't blame what came out of those mouths upon God. God expects us to prepare. God prepare, expects us to study to know the word. But you don't have to worry if someone calls upon you and says, what if they ask me a question about the Bible I don't know? Well, then don't worry about it. Depend upon the Holy Spirit to put the words in your mouth. Now see, at that point, you're turning over. You're putting it out of your hands. You're stepping out into faith. You're laying yourself on the altar and trusting God. Well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's going to do. I don't know what's going to happen. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. If you trust in God, and I think that's the major issue here, do you indeed trust God? Or do you just say you do? Do you trust Him? Has He ever let you down? Has he ever failed you? Has he ever left you? So then why do we have a trust issue with him? Well, this is a big one, Pastor. This is a big circumstance. I don't read in the Bible where it says, God can handle moderately sized circumstances. God, the one true and living God, can do all things. He specializes in things that we know as human beings to be impossible. So the question comes down to, do you trust him? Well, then you don't need to worry because if someone asks you something and you have been a good student of the word, but you're afraid you don't know it, then allow the Holy Spirit to give you the answer. And that happens to me. Because sometimes I want to give the answer Randall wants to give. The answer that Randall has prepared. But then God has a different answer. So we don't need to worry about that. And we don't need to worry about looking ignorant. If we depend upon God. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. He's not going to let us down. The comforter teaches us all things. Okay, But do you know that a teacher cannot teach you unless you are willing to learn? A teacher can do his or her best to teach you, but if you're there like, I ain't paying attention to this, I don't need this. I don't even think this is going to be on the test. Why do I need this? So if you're willing to be taught, the Holy Spirit will teach you. He's not going to force his teaching on you. God doesn't operate that way. But if you're willing to be taught, the Holy Spirit will teach you, first of all, from the Word of God. But you have to get into the Word of God. I have never known of the Holy Spirit teaching a person 
by the old family Bible laying dusty on the coffee table, all of a sudden words just pop out and teach you. Doesn't happen that way. Doesn't happen if you put the Word of God under your pillow and expect to learn from osmosis. It doesn't happen that way. You and I have to make the effort as students, as willing learners, to get into the Word of God. And then also to be sensitive to the Spirit on a daily basis as we are walking through life and all the challenges of life so the Holy Spirit can guide us. So I don't have to worry about, the, about God leaving me. When someone is inquiring, he will give me the words to say. Now, I can look totally ignorant on my own, but God never makes me look ignorant. When we do our part by studying God's Word, we do our part by praying and then being sensitive to His Spirit. Because when you get into the Word of God and then you pray, God, let me apply this today, then God answers that prayer. While I was in North Carolina, my cousin who has battled cancer and is now they have deemed him cancer-free, he said, I ask the Lord every day in the morning that I would be able to share what God has done for me with someone that day, and he said he has answered that prayer every day. So God will give us the opportunities that we ask him. But we need to know what God wants us to do we need to do it so that in the end we can hear the words well done good and faithful servant after all that's what we're we're aiming for that's what we're working for right but then he says that the Holy Spirit the comforter will bring back to our remembrance now the older we get the more we may worry about forgetting but the Comforter brings God's teachings back to our remembrance. We read here in John 14. But here's what I know. I have to, I have to, you have to put it into the memory bank first. Because the little bit I know about computers besides turning it off and back on if it doesn't work right is that input affects output. You can't get something out of a computer that's not being input to the computer. And so I need to input God's Word into my little Commodore 64 brain up here so that then the Holy Spirit can bring it back to my remembrance. If I don't put it in there, how can He bring it back? If I'm not doing my part, why should I just sit back and ask Him to do it all? I need to put the Word of God into my memory so that the Holy Spirit can bring it back. So if all that you've ever put into your Bible memory bank is Jesus wept, and every time someone asks you about the Word of God or they ask you about Jesus, you're like, well, he wept. That's all you got? Put more into the memory bank so that God can bring it back to your remembrance, so that you can share it with others. You know, and it's usually not effective for you. Wait, wait a minute, let me see if I can find this. You lose people's attention, but when the Holy Spirit brings it back to your remembrance, you're able to share it. That means that a time when you are not witnessing to people, a time when you're in your prayer closet or you're starting your day, that you put it into your memory bank that day. So we can depend on him to bring it back to us. But that's not all the help that we need the comforter to help us in remembering. Number one... We need the Comforter, God the Holy Spirit, to remind us, bring back to our remembrance where we came from. You were not born a theologian. You were not born with a shining halo and little angel wings poking out of your back. We were all born sinners. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Paul wrote the church at Rome. So we all needed a Savior. Maybe you still need a Savior today, and, and you're at the right place for that. God will uh, forgive you when you confess your sins to Him. Ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. But we need to be reminded where we came from. We weren't always saints, and I don't even like that term. We weren't always children of God. We had to become children of God. 
He justified us as if we'd never sinned by the blood of Jesus Christ. He regenerated us, made us new creatures in Christ Jesus, and adopted us into his own family. We became children of God. But we need to be reminded of where we came from. We weren't always children of God. Some of you did some things that probably would scare me to death if I knew what you were really like before Christ. I probably wouldn't want to even be in the same room with you because I'd be scared of you. But God. I love that part of every testimony. You can say whatever it is that you were. You know, it's like a testimony goes like this. He's like, and you get to that lowest point but God, and then your testimony goes like this. That's the way a proper testimony goes. I was, uh, you know, a dead man. Uh, I was, uh, you know, dead in trespasses and sins. I had done this and this and this and this, but God, and now he's made me into the person I am today. And you may say, well, God's still working on me. I believe God's going to work on us until we're in his presence. But not only does the comforter need to remind us of where we came from, he needs to remind us about important points on our journey. Has God ever healed your body? Has God ever been there when there were more bills than there was paycheck? Has God ever been there when you were so depressed you didn't think you could carry on and he lifted up your head, he revived, refreshed, renewed you? Has God ever broken an addiction off of you? We need to be reminded of those things because what usually happens is that we forget how much God has already done. And what makes me think that we forget is when we're going through what we're going through right now, sometimes we think, well, can God help me this time? Is God able to help me this time? We wouldn't ask ourselves that question if we took time and remembered all, everyone say all, all of the times God has already helped us in the past. And if you will take time and revisit those points on your journey where God has already helped you, healed you, delivered you, saved you, uh, helped you, blessed you, whatever, protected you, then you will be reminded, you will know in this storm, you will know in this battle that God can do it again. Same God, not changed. Same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's the same God. So why? Because it's this particular storm, the latest battle. Why then would God's arms be so short that he could not help you this time? So what you need to do is as you revisit those points on your journey, your faith will be built up. Your faith will be renewed so that you know what you're going through today is not too hard for him, is not too great for him. And then what we should probably all do is feel bad that we doubted him in the first place. Because if he did it then, he can do it today. He's the same God. Do you have the same faith that you had? Or maybe you just need your faith to grow as you testify to yourself about what God has already done. He needs for us to know that he's the same God. We need to know that he's able. We need to trust him to do it again. We need to ask him to do it again. Because sometimes in our pride, oh, not me, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in our pride, we think we can handle it. My personal experience has been And I'm not proud of this. I'm just telling you that I can take this size mess and make it this size. That's my gifting. And then I have to take this size mess and give it to God when I should have taken this size mess and given it to God. If you have ever said, I did everything I know to do and then I prayed, then you have it backwards. 
before you do anything, you should pray. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. But if you're trying to handle it yourself, that is at its very core a pride issue. You're not submitting to God. You're not asking him or seeking his help. So that's where you need to start. And the comforter needs to remind us every day to go deeper in our relationship with God, to become more intimate in our relationship with God because we need a relationship with God that is growing. We need to nurture that relationship with God. It needs to become stronger. Our roots need to go down deeper because I can't believe what I've already seen in my lifetime, and my life's not over yet. I don't know what's coming. But what I do know is God can handle whatever's coming. But I don't need to be the weak little tree with little shallow roots and get blown over by it. I need to have my relationship so deep, so planted, so strong, so nurtured in God that nothing, nothing, Absolutely nothing will rock it. Second Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. This, I was reminded of this, this was on a card that I received. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. The Father of mercies. I love in a book called Lamentations. It's a sad title, right? It's like, you know, if you go uh, watch Les Miserables, it's not about a party. It's not about happy people. It's right in the title, The Miserable Ones. Lamentations, in that book, it talks about that God's mercies are renewed every day. And I'm so thankful for that because in myself, sometimes I think I may have yesterday used up even up to my last mercy. I may have tried God up until the nth degree in my mind. But then to realize, to remind myself, for to let the comforter bring back to my remembrance that God's mercies are renewed every day. So if you used them all up yesterday, it's good news. Today is a new day. The Father of mercies and God of all comfort. <laughs> this is the new King James, by the way. The God of all comfort, who comforts us in some of our tribulations? No. Who comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now see, for those of you who are cynical, who are always looking for what's the catch, here's the catch. Right here, in this verse. When we are down and out, when we are at our wit's end, when we are at the end of our rope, when we've tied that piddly knot and we're trying to hang on, and we think, I won't ever get through this. I won't ever be the same. It will never be normal again. Who are we thinking about? Me. Me, 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 me. It's all about me when I need comfort. When I'm focused on me, I don't see that you need comfort. Because all I can see is me and my need for comfort. So you may be hurting as bad as or worse than me, but I'm not paying attention to you because I'm focused on me. But when we allow the God of all mercies and comfort to comfort us, then we need to turn our focus outward and comfort others. But pastor, I don't want to. I know. That's why I'm talking to you about it. Because you know what happens is, I have found 
that once we get our comfort, most of the time we want to close that chapter down tight. And we want to go back into happy, happy, joy, joy. But I love what Pastor Rick Warren said, never waste a hurt. Do you know that the most impactful ministry that you and I can have is when we share from our deepest pain, the worst hurts, how that God helped us through that time. Now, are you a social media Christian that you just post on there when everything's going great and you know you've punched the devil in the nose and things are going great and you're doing your little victory dance? Do you realize that doesn't help as many people as if you were to go to, back to that pain, back to that uh, desperation, back to that hurt, back to that brokenness, and then tell people, even on social media, how God found you at your lowest when you were like Humpty Dumpty and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put you back together again. You know who could? God did. He took all those broken pieces, all those pieces that were just broken apart, and all of the pain and all of the hurt that went with it, God and God alone was the only one powerful enough, the only one loving enough, the only one merciful enough, the only one comforting enough to put it all back together again. So shame on you if you want to hide that away from the world. You want to lock that away and say that's a closed chapter. Shame on you because you can help somebody else by sharing your hurt and your pain and how God brought you out of it. I'm afraid sometimes we don't let the world see enough of our brokenness. Sometimes I think the world thinks that we're in denial because we're always, you know, you know, there's something about uh, Christian songs. Sometimes they just get on my last nerve. That, you know, that song from years ago, oh, I'm not in a valley, I'm just changing mountains. There are valleys, Doc. There are valleys, people. Look around you. There are valleys. Did you jump from one mountaintop to the other mountaintop? I think not. You went through the stinking valley. Well, pastor, that song is trying to convey, I don't care. What I care about is honesty. What I care about is transparency. That people need to know that sometimes, no matter how close we are to God, no matter how long we've served God, that we still hurt. That there is still pain and we need the comforter, the Holy Spirit of God to help us. It's not always sugar plums. It's not always joy, joy, happy, happy. Sometimes it is painful. But God is there in the midst of the pain and in the midst of the storm. And he brings us through it. And the world needs to know that. So if you hide your pain from other people, shame on you. So here are the action steps. Get comfort from your pain. You know the people who don't want to get comfort from their pain? Are the people who have taken on their, affirm their infirmity as their identity. What are you, what are you talking about, Pastor? Uh, an infirmity is my identity. Look in the Bible. When a name is not mentioned, but an, affir uh, an infirmity is mentioned, that infirmity had become the person's identity. The woman with the issue of blood. The blind man. The man that had the palsy. The crippled man. The lame man. The leper. Thank you. But God never came across an infirmity that he could not heal. But the question is, 
like he came to the, in John chapter 5, Jesus comes to the man at the pool of Bethesda who had laid there for almost 40 years, if you round up. And his question to him is, do you want to be made whole? And as I've said before, I always thought that that was a silly question to ask before I went into ministry. After being in ministry for rounding up close to 40 years, I found some people don't want to be made whole. Some people have gotten so comfortable with their infirmity that they don't want to be someone else. Their lives would be so different if God indeed healed them, but they, are afraid, they don't want to ask him because they wouldn't even know who they were without the infirmity. So if you want to get comfort from your pain, you have to ask God to deliver you from that pain. Get comfort from the not knowing part. I don't know. What if people ask me this? Let the Holy Spirit fill your mouth, give you the words to say. Don't be afraid. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Get comfort from being reminded. The Holy Spirit can bring back to your remembrance if you put it up there to begin with. If you haven't put it up there to begin with, there's nothing coming back. I'm just telling you right now. Spoiler alert. If you're expecting God to bring back something that you never put in there, he doesn't do it that way. It's an if-then. If you put it in there, then he will bring it back. If you do not put it in there, he will not bring it back. And then, once you get comfort, comfort others. Now, see, that's the thing. Sometimes we enjoy the getting comfort part. You don't have to acknowledge that. I already know. Some of your faces are giving it away. We enjoy the getting comfort. We are more reluctant to comfort others. But here's the key. I believe, and I have believed ever since that I uh, have become pastor of this church, that to see all of these gray chairs filled, and yes, there are extra gray chairs here because we're getting ready for summer conference. I believe to see those gray chairs filled, it doesn't take uh, me subscribing to five easy steps to grow your church or reading the right book or, or any of those growth, church growth expert things. Here's what I believe will grow this church. The ministry of the Holy Spirit of God, just like in the book of Acts. The difference is the people in the book of Acts were willing to share about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they were willing to comfort those that were hurting. Every day, I would dare say, every day, each and every one of us comes across someone who is hurting. Well, not in my life, Pastor. I don't see anybody that's hurting. Have you looked? Have you asked God to show you the people that are hurting? Try that before you tell me they're not out there. I believe that when we, as a church, and I believe this is true about the American church, not just this church, when we stop acting like a hospital, where we come to get comfort, but we start taking it outside these walls and comforting others, the Holy Spirit is going to show you his power. He comforted you, but he's no respecter of persons. He's willing to comfort other people. There are hurting people galore out there in this town, in the city limits of this town, enough to fill these chairs three or four times over, if not more so. But see, we become comfortable in our infirmity. We keep coming to the hospital. I need the Lord to bless me today. Didn't he do that last week? What else do you need God to do? It goes back to that point of disobedience. If we are not comforting others, then we are disobeying God's word. I believe that when we are obedient and we share from our pain, 
what God has done for us. Not that we're just changing mountains, but we've actually been through valleys and God was with us every step of the way. He helped us, he healed us, he delivered us, he helped us, he strengthened us. Then we will be able to minister to others. I believe that the majority of ministry at Christian Life Center will not be here. There will be some here. In the worship time, in in the altar time. But the majority of ministry will happen when you minister to the hurting out there. The Holy Spirit brings, uh, puts the words in your mouth, brings back to your remembrance the word that you've hidden in your heart. He'll bring back to your mind. And you start praying for people. You start witnessing to people, sharing your faith. You start ministering out there. Then it will overflow back into here. So many times we've looked at it to be the other way around. That it starts here and goes out there. I believe that we have the, uh, the model shifted. The paradigm needs to be inverted. Thank you, James Cosme. We need to be the hands and feet of Jesus reaching out to the oppressed wherever it is that we go. It's that simple. Well, Pastor, I'm afraid. God's not giving us a spirit of fear. He will help you. Get over any fear. You know, if you want to be afraid of something, let me tell you what you should be afraid of. Not not the fact that you're afraid to share your faith, you're afraid to pray for someone in public. Oh! But standing before God and telling Him why you wouldn't do it. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you today for this opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for the opportunity to call on your name. We thank you that you love us unconditionally. God, I pray for those that are in pain today that you would provide comfort. God, that you would provide comfort from pain. God, that as we leave this place, you would give us comfort in the ability to speak up for what you've done for us, to share our story of what you've done in our lives. God, you would free us from this reluctance, this anxiety of not being able to remember everything, but your Holy Spirit will put words in our mouth and bring back to our remembrance. But God, as you comfort us, help us not to forget that we are then to comfort others. Let the world see our hurts. Let the world see our scars, our battle scars. But then, Lord, let that be followed up with the testimony of how you saw us through. Through every sickness, through every lack of provision, for every addiction, for every depression, for every suicidal thought, for everything that we have gone through, every broken relationship, every infirmity. God, let the world see the scars that were there, but then let us quickly share how you brought us through. How that we are survivors because of you. And let us give you all the glory so that others who are hurting can be ministered to as well. We give you thanks and praise for that in Jesus' name. If you are in pain today, you want special prayer, you can come forward, we will pray for you. But I would encourage you if that you would take a few moments and in prayer with your head bowed at your seat or at the altar or in some part of the room, that you would ask God, is there any area of disobedience? For the Holy Spirit to point that out to you so you can ask for forgiveness and make it right. But if you have a special need, I just want you to come forward and let's pray together.